This message I'm inspired to present about the desire for prophecy. It is coming from a perspective of why it is actually a good thing to desire prophecy. Now I know some people may quote scriptures and say Jesus spoke about a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But even Jesus himself was a sign. And he spoke about the sign of Jonah, referring to himself being on the ground for three days and then he'll rise again. And some would say, we have the scriptures, and the scriptures are more than enough. I have some scriptures to present. And in presenting these scriptures, there were scriptures before those scriptures, the canonization of the Bible, yet, even though there were scriptures, prophecy was still necessary. When you look in Revelation 11, a time that has not come yet, the Lord will send two witnesses, two prophets, to prophesy for three and a half years. They will prophesy. So even though we have the scriptures now, it doesn't negate the need for prophecy. So I'm going to show you some reasons why people desire prophecy. And yet others may say, but the just shall live by faith. Hmm. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Faith has substance and then it provides evidence. So the just shall live by his faith. But scripture also says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God is not only the Logon, the written word, but also the Rhema, what he may choose to reveal at any point in time, based on his sovereignty. So yes, the just shall live by his or her faith, but faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And there's something that prophecy can do that scriptures don't always do. Or a person may not be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, highlighting something in the scriptures that applies to the person's life at the point in time. And I know there are people out there that are saying the Bible is not about you, it's about the things that happen in the Bible, Old Testament, and pointing to the coming of Christ, New Testament, Christ arrival, and all those things. But we can still learn things from the Bible, and the Lord can still use things in the scriptures that points to us. But ultimately in doing so, because in Revelation 19.10, the angel let us know the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So a prophetic word from the Lord leads to the Lord Jesus Christ. It helps to strengthen our relationship with Him. So over the next several minutes, okay, maybe about 30 minutes or so, I'm going to speak about the desire for prophecy from a perspective why that is actually a good thing. In 1 Corinthians 14, and in the NASB version of the Bible, there's the Subheader, prophecy, a superior gift. Let's start in verse 1 through 3. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. What kind of tongue is that? I digress. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speak to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. So in verse 3, it lets us know prophecy edifies, it exhorts, and it comforts. It exhorts. Could be something fiery. You need to repent. Hey, that's a good thing. It edifies. You're going down the right path, or you're going down the wrong path. Giving you direction what to do. It comforts. Oh, Mary. Let me back up to Sarah. After hearing her husband Abraham, or Abraham at the time, speak about the Lord is going to bless him with children. 
and then the Lord's gonna bless him with a son. And we can presume she knew these things. It wasn't happening. And then one day, she herself heard from the Lord that by this time next year, he was gonna bless her with a son. Yes, it kind of sounded ridiculous at the time. Well, Sarah laughed. But it happened. How comforting it was to receive those words. But prophecy is not always fluffy. So regarding the desire for prophecy, and there are many manifestations of prophecy, as we're going to see with the first scripture, Genesis 40. Now, during the time of Genesis 40, when the events were unfolding, there weren't any scriptures for people to rely on. However, the man credited with writing the first five books of the Bible, Moses, this was a part of the scriptures people had at the time. And with these scriptures, just like a spoken word could edify the people, not only could but did edify, exhort, and provide comfort. So in Genesis 40, I think I'll read the entire thing. It reads, Then came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker, and the king, for the king of Egypt, offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Oh, by the way, in Genesis 39, Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers. The Ishmaelites took him to Egypt, where the Ishmaelites sold Joseph to Potiphar, Pharaoh's captain of his guards. Potiphar's wife accused him of misdoing. As a result, Potiphar put him in prison. But even while these things were going on in Joseph's life, Joseph had a prophecy from the Lord via two dreams that are recording in Genesis 37. So despite all the things that are going on in Joseph's life, whenever he thought back to the things the Lord had revealed to him, it could provide comfort. It could provide comfort. So continue in Genesis 40. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them. Hmm. And he took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. But the cupbearer, or Christian, then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each dream with his own interpretation. When Joseph came in, the came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. So they had a prophet, or they had a dream. Of course, with a dream, a couple of preliminary steps. What was the source of the dream? A person's soul? The enemy or the Lord. Then once those things or once the answer is determined from that, okay, you had a dream. What does it mean? The meaning of a dream is more significant when it's coming from the Lord. When it's coming from the enemy, the enemy may be trying a bunch of stuff, and sometimes we can get too focused on what the enemy is trying. Because a lot of times, even dreams of an enemy show how much he's been failing at what he's been trying to do. So they were dejected. So the interpretation of the dream, presumably, could provide them comfort. It could also edify. He asked Pharaoh's officials, who were with him in confinement, in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. 
and it was budding. Its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. As I say that, I can imagine. The cupbearer had been in the dark, and then suddenly Joseph saying that three branches represents three days. It's kind of like, man, why didn't I think about that? It's like slowly the veil is being removed from his eyes as Joseph, by the Spirit of God, is telling him these things. So a man who was looking dejected, despondent, now getting illumination, the truth does set us free. So finding out what it meant was like, okay, it's like, keep going. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. Wouldn't it be a good thing to know? Also think about the cupbearer, well, all three men being in prison. They're people who are going through things, trials, and one of the reasons why they would desire prophecy is to at least know when the trial is going to end. Have you ever done like a long distance race? When I say long distance, say more than a mile. And you're pacing yourself. But then when you see the finish line, you can dig as deep as you possibly can and you make a sprint for the finish line because you see the end coming. And in fact, seeing the finish line gives you an extra, it's like an extra shot of adrenaline. So you can sprint. Now you may throw up after you cross the finish line. But after the race, or when it race, you know it's coming to an end. You can pick it up. But if you don't know when the race is going to end, it's like you try to pace yourself, conserve energy, sometimes not to get too excited. But here it is, Joseph was telling him, yeah, you've been in prison for some time. But in three days, by God's grace, you are going to be free. Some people pro covet prophecy. They want to know because they're in dire straits and they want to know when it's going to end. So yes, the just shall live by his faith. But faith com comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Imagine how much better this man felt. Hearing about the three branches representing three days and about Pharaoh reinstating him. Prophecy. At least this kind of prophecy gives hope. Also part of prophecy pointing to Jesus is that Jesus is the truth. And a prophecy from the Lord is the truth. Prophecy is not always cotton candy type stuff. Because even edifying what a person is edified with isn't always good because edification may result in exhortation, a call to repentance, to let a person know that he or she is in sin and what the consequences are or will be. So back to verse 13. Within three, within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in, into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. And some more stuff. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you. And please do me kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was, in fact, kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. Even here I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. I pause. So not only was a cupbearer going through a hard time, Joseph was going through a hard time. And by the way, sometimes people hear prophecies nowadays and they want to quote unquote name it and claim it. It's like, oh, that's my word. Joseph didn't say, well, because you're getting out in three days, I'm getting out in three days. He did ask him and there was a possibility of him getting out. But the word of the Lord, you know, came through Joseph was for the cupbearer that he was going to get out in three days. It gave Joseph a little bit of hope that he would get out. 
And by the way, many people are getting into a habit of falsely prophesying because in the book of Job, it spoke about the creative thing and it shall be established. But Second Peter or First Peter 2, verse 21, let me verify. Sometimes I get that scripture crossed in my mind. It's first Peter, first Peter or Second Peter one correction. Second Peter one twenty one. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So some people are getting in the habit of falsely prophesying because they're like, well, I just decree something. Or even Jesus spoke about whatever you do, ask for my name, the Father will give it to you. So they use those things and they're starting to prophesy or pseudo-prophesy. And they're decreeing things that doesn't come to pass. And they keep on doing this, the same stuff over and over again. And while it can be viewed as an act of faith, it is also one of the ways that people start falsely prophesying. And they make it to a point where they falsely prophesy, they don't repent, and they develop a bad habit the least leader credibility being shot later on and they could be dubbed as false prophets because they develop a bad habit. Prophecy does not come from the will of man, but people should speak as God leads. Then he will watch over his words perform them. Then he's responsible for his words. He doesn't have to do what we say, but he has to do what he said. I continue. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there are three baskets of white bread on my head. Now imagine the, the baker hearing the butler, the chief, the cupbearer, having a dream, and it seemed as if the language was specific to the cupbearer, and the baker's dream was specific to him, but he just heard that the cupbearer was going to be restored in three days. And he's thinking, or potentially thinking, he saw like three grapes, vines of grapes, and I had three baskets. Could my dream mean the same thing? Which is also a cautionary tale. Be careful about being locked into certain things that, because it becomes a form of divination, if you start thinking, something always means this, when it means something else. And we always have to go to the Lord to ask Him what things mean. And even this asking the Lord what it means. Lord, was this dream or vision from you? What does it mean? It brings you closer to the Lord. And that will give you a desire for prophecy. Of course, things be done in right order. And in the top basket were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Now imagine for the baker, man, it's like I'm getting the same interpretation. Could it be? I'm just kind of thinking outside the box, not that these were the thoughts of the baker, but the potential is there. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. That's sounding good. It's sounding similar. And will hang you on a tree. Uh-oh. And the birds will eat your flesh off you. When you desire prophecy from the Lord, you desire the truth. Joseph didn't tell both these men you're going to be restored in three days. He gave them the truth. So desiring prophecy is desiring the truth. I think it's Jeremiah 42 where the people went to Jeremiah and asked him to inquire for the Lord for them. And what sort of Lord said he would do, or they would do, when the Lord answered Jeremiah ten days later, they didn't do what the Lord had said. A person who desires prophecy is desiring the truth. Similarly in 1 Kings 22, 
Ahab, he asked his prophets, they're all saying, go to Ramoth Gilead, you'd be successful. But they weren't prophesying by the Spirit of the Lord. Oh yes, a prophet is a spokesperson for a deity. Whether it's Yahweh, the true living God, or another lowercase G-O-D. A prophecy is about the truth. In 1 Kings 22, Jehoshaphat asked if there isn't a man of God, a prophet of the Lord, they can inquire of. They called for Micaiah, a prophet of the Lord. Micaiah told him exactly what went on in heaven, that even the Lord had sent a deceiving spirit to be a, or a spirit to be a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets to cause him to go to Ramoth Gilead to die. But even though they found out the truth, actually both kings took their armies to Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat almost died. He cried out to the Lord. The Lord had mercy upon him. Ahab, not so much. He was shot. It took, took a while to bleed out, but he died that day. And to add sin to sin, he had Micaiah the prophet imprisoned because he didn't want the truth. What Micaiah said, it was edifying. It was an exhortation. But especially Ahab, he didn't want it. So the desire of prophecy is the desire of truth. Where if you're in sin, where the Lord lets you know, then you repent. A lot of times we say what we call the Lord's Prayer, and we say, not my will, but thy will be done. But if the Lord tells us what he wants us to do, it's like, oh no. So Joseph was telling these men the truth. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Interpreting a dream from, interpreting a dream from the Lord becomes a prophecy. In Jeremiah 1, the Lord called Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. The Lord gave him two visions, but then he told him what the visions meant. And the words the Lord spoke became the word of the Lord based on those visions. We also see in Daniel, a few chapters in the book of Daniel, where Daniel had dreams, or King Nebuchadnezzar had dreams or, or other experiences. And the Lord used Daniel to interpret the dreams, and the interpretation became the prophecy. In Daniel 4, he told the king about repenting of his pride. Nebuchadnezzar did not. A year later, he fell. Or more accurately, the Lord humbled him. And in verse 23 of Genesis 40, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So it wasn't about naming and claiming it. Joseph asked a cupbearer to do something, but that was not the word the Lord had for him. Because, for Joseph, that is. In Psalm 105, it speaks about until it was time for the fulfillment of his word, that the word of the Lord tried him. This was one of many trials in Joseph's life. Well, he said to the cupbearer and the baker, this interpretation of the dream was a prophecy. Both men received the prophecy. And for some people, hearing a prophecy that they're going to pass away, and maybe by a certain time, at least it gives them an opportunity to get things right with God. So even a prophecy about a person who's about to pass away should be a source of comfort. As I'm saying that, I'm reminded of a, at the Last Supper when Jesus, he didn't call him by name, but rebuking Judas, saying that he will go as it has been spoken about of him. But wanted one who betrays the Son of Man, it would have been better if he'd never been born. That was an exhortation. Judas followed through, which meant the Lord's going to follow through with what he said. So that's Genesis 40. And those events happened before there were scriptures. So those men 
needed prophecy to get direction, to get clarity regarding what was going to happen in their lives. And it was helpful. In another example, there were scriptures. They could um, read from the Torah. Yet, what happened in this example? A man relied on prophecy. The word of the Lord, not spoken through scriptures, was spoken from his mouth. King Saul had David on the run. And for safety, and we could even say sanity, David fled to be with the Philistines. And Achish, I should treat him well, gave him a city named Ziklag. There was going to be a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. David was going to fight with the Philistines against the Israelite army. Well, the lords of the Philistines were uncomfortable with David and his men, so they sent him back. And this is what happened when they were sent back. And this story I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 19. Then it happened, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev, the wilderness, and on Ziklag, and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went on their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. There's even a theme. Genesis 40. All three men were in dire straits or in prison. Here it is. David and his men in prison. The little city of Ziklag had been burned, families taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted, lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now, David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Oh boy. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. The importance of having a personal relationship with the Lord when all the odds are against you to lean on the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord. David didn't say to Abiathar the priest, Go get me the scriptures. And this is not to marginalize the scriptures. For probably more than a year, the Lord has been having me speak about the unification of the Word and the Holy Spirit. And it's not that they have been divided, but people have been dividing them. Sometimes saying because, in a sense, because we have the Word, we don't need things of the Spirit. But also, some people are culpable by making it seem because we have the things of the Holy Spirit, that we don't need a Word. We need both. So David, he didn't say, bring me the scriptures. He didn't say, bring me the scriptures. He said, bring me the ephod. What was he going to do? David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? So asking the Lord a question. Now, we don't need to get an ephod today. All we have to do is just ask the Lord. The answer is not always immediate, but to ask the Lord. Because the criticism I have of 
some people were so reliant on the word, the Bible, that oftentimes hear comments that seem as if what they do first is to search the scriptures rather than asking the Lord. Taking things to him in prayer. Sometimes by simply asking, Lord, what is your will in this situation? Because we can even fall into error by saying, well, I know there's a scripture in the Bible that says this, and because the scripture says this, then this is what we should do. In a situation, should you turn over the cheek, or should you turn over tables? Jesus spoke about turning over the cheek, yet in a position he turned over tables. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this band? But there's more. Shall I overtake them? So being specific, David was seeking guidance and he was in dire straits. And he said to him, meaning God, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them and you will surely rescue all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook, to the brook, that sore, where those left behind remained. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor, remained behind. Now they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David, and gave him bread and he ate, and they provided him water to drink. They gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins, and he ate. Then his spirit revived. Which is also when we receive the word of the Lord, we a prophecy, and we may feel despondent like David as a man, or the cupbearer and the baker, where we receive the word of the Lord, and it revives us. Again, like the running analogy I used earlier, it's like because you see the finish line, it allows you to endure and sometimes the Lord will give a prophecy because the finish line is near but it also means the enemy is going to fight harder and that word is to strengthen your faith it's to comfort you during a time of discomfort for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights David said to him to whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. We made a raid of Negev, of the Cherethites, and on that which belongs to Judah, and on the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. There they had a broadcast with Dr. Arliza and we're spoken about prophecy and about did God really say and does it bear fruit along the way? David inquired for the Lord. The Lord told him go and that he will he will overcome, he will recover all. But along the way to find the Amalekites, he found a servant of the Amalekites. One of those things along the way, letting a person know that yes, not that they're in doubts, but yes, the Lord has spoken, and here's some things along the way, that this thing is about to come to pass. Then David said to him, Will you bring me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I'll bring you down to this band. So they left him behind three days ago. It had been a while. But the Lord told him, Pursue, you will recover all. When he had brought him down, behold, they were spread all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. That was a long battle. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men, who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all, just like the Lord told him. 
and all the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. But nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had taken for themselves, David brought it back. So in a time of great discomfort, the word of the Lord brought him comfort. And by the way, even if the Lord had told him, do not pursue, you will not recover all, at least they will know. Because there are times when people are seeking closure in something. A family member goes missing, they're seeking closure. And there are times when I see people posting things like on Facebook, tell me someone's missing. And I ask the Lord, Lord, please bring that person back, whether alive or dead. Because it makes a big difference knowing. That's what prophecy does. Things that are hidden, the Lord uses to bring clarity. And yes, the enemy has his counterfeit, divination and the like. So another example, and again in this case, there were scriptures, the Torah, but it wasn't about looking, for, looking through the scriptures to get the word of God for that particular situation. It was about inquiring of the Lord. So yes, even today, we can read the Bible, it will help to strengthen our faith. But there are times when we need to ask the Lord, take things to Him in prayer, and say, Lord, what is your answer here? And let Him answer the way He chooses. So David, he had a desire for prophecy. He asked the Lord, and the Lord answered him. And as the Lord had spoken, so He did. I mentioned the enemy has his counterfeits and the desire for prophecy. It can go overboard to the point where people start resorting to the things of darkness. An example, when Saul learned of the battle or the pending battle, let's see what he did. So two prior chapters to 1 Samuel 30. In 1 Samuel 28, and I'll read from verses 1 through 7. Now it came about in those days that the Philistines gathered their armed camps for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Know assuredly that you will go out with me into the camp, you and your men. David said to Achish, Very well. You shall know what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, Very well. I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Samuel was dead. Samuel the prophet was dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. Mediums, those who professed to speak to the dead, even though they were speaking to evil spirits, familiar spirits. So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they camped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Israelites, or correction, the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Saul was in a dire situation. He wasn't like, let me go look at Leviticus. Let me go look at um, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Exodus. He inquired of the Lord. Now a person can inquire of the Lord today, and the Lord may point a person to a particular scripture, and that scripture will be the word of the Lord to the person. That is possible. But again, a lot of times nowadays, a lot of people, They'll seek the scriptures or based on memories or they may do a Google search of what does the Bible say about this as opposed to going to the Lord and asking Him, what is your guidance in this situation? And the Holy Spirit being in us, He brings things to our recollection. So in asking the Lord a question, the Holy Spirit may actually bring a scripture to mind. And in going to the scripture, it may be like, man, 
I never thought that this scripture would apply to this situation. But clearly this is from the Lord because I never saw this scripture as being applicable. But this scripture here is truly resonating deep in me. Deep calls to deep. So Saul, he didn't start searching scriptures. He inquired of the Lord. But the Lord answered him, did not answer him, either by dreams, one of the ways the Lord communicates, or by Urim, or by prophets. Now because Samuel was dead, it didn't mean there were, other prof were not other prophets in the land. So Saul was desperate. If desperation becomes your inspiration, and you seek the Lord, that's a good thing. But if desperation becomes an inspiration for you to seek the enemy, not good. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, a witch, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants did to him, or said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So we see quite a few stories here. Men who are desperate and seeking the Lord. Saul, the Lord had already warned him multiple times to repent. See, he received prophecies to edify him that he was in at enmity with the Lord. He received prophecies to exhort him to repent, but he refused. Then now the Lord doesn't communicate with him at all. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, the Lord let Samuel know, How long will you mourn over Saul, seeing I have rejected him as king? So it should come as no surprise that even his dire straits, that the Lord is not communicating with him. So Saul, in his desire for prophecy, hmm, great point, my Lord. So Saul, in his desire for prophecy, he went elsewhere. And a part of this message, a very important part, is that in your desire for prophecy, and even though true prophecy leads you to the Lord, is that you have to ensure you desire God more than you desire any prophecy. A couple who's driving, for example, a long distance, they don't have to speak every second of that journey. Just being in their presence is enough. And it's likewise with our relationship with the Lord. Being in His presence should be good enough. And if He decides to communicate or speak, that's a good thing. Because there's even communication in silence. If you're with someone who's angry, and a person like this, the other person communicating all right, and hopefully you know. So again, in your desire for prophecy, always ensure you desire the Most High God, more so than prophecy. I have just a couple more examples regarding desiring prophecy. And I was just inspired to mark some scriptures beforehand, but I keep seeing a theme of times of desperation. In 2 Kings 20, and I'll read from verses 1 through 11. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Again, prophecy is not always fluffy. Set your house in order. You shall surely die and shall not live. Some people die without setting their house in order. The prophet didn't tell him when. You shall die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth, and with a whole heart, and have done 
what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now some people act as if if you receive a prophecy, all you have to do is just rebuke it and that ends it. The Lord sent Isaiah and when Isaiah said it, Hezekiah was going to die. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of your father, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. I pause for a second. So the Lord said he was going to die. Now, I didn't tell him when. But he said he heard his prayers. Even a prophecy may even include the Lord has heard your cries. The Lord has seen the injustices coming against you. The Lord loves righteousness and justice and he will judge. He will restore all the years the locust has eaten. Now words like that may not always end what a person is going through at that moment. But at least it lets the person know the Lord sees. Genesis 16, when Hagar was going through her stuff, she found out that God saw her. Just the fact that God saw her was comforting. So to be able to hear that God saw his tears, heard his cries. Comforting. It didn't mean that Hezekiah was going to live forever. But the Lord is having mercy on him. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. We also see some specifics here, kind of with Joseph, in three days. It gets better. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I'll defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Same as stuff. Take a, a cake of figs and put it on the boil. So think about an adulterous son, generation seeks after a sign. So even with this, the boil recovering, it served as a sign that a king would recover. And it makes sense. If that part was true, then he was going to live for 15 years. Now, telling him he was going to die in 15 years, the initial prophecy about get your house in order, that still applies about his house being in order. And yes, he was still going to die. The Lord just extended it. It's not that the Lord changed his mind, as in the king was no longer going to die. It was going to happen only a little bit later because I know how the enemy can twist things in people's minds where they get off course with the Lord talking about God changes mind but it's not the way <laughs> they're thinking or making things out to be continue verse 8 now Hezekiah said to Isaiah what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me now the king wasn't trying to tempt the Lord he simply wanted to know. As James wrote, you have not because you ask not. And we need to start asking the Lord even more. What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Arguably the biggest sign could be the prophet Isaiah told you so. But he asked for more. Isaiah said, this shall be the sign 
Now in the book of Isaiah, the account of this is slightly different. But I stick with this one. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? This is about the sundial of Ahaz. So Hezekiah answered, it is easy for the shadow to decline ten steps. But they, no, but let the shadow turn backward ten steps. So he wasn't tempting God by asking for this as a sign. Imagine a sundial going backwards. Oh, by the way, he said it's an easy thing for the shadow to decline ten steps. But in the Lord, nothing is too hard for him. What we may see, think is easier or harder for the Lord is nothing for him. Remember, he formed the world just by speaking. Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow of the stair on the stairway back ten steps, by which it had gone down to the, Ahaz, to the stairway of Ahaz. Hezekiah was in dire straits. He sought the Lord. The Lord sent the same prophet who had prophesied to him before to extend his life by 15 years, to give him a sign that he would be healed, also pointing that he would live for an extra 15 years. There were a lot of scriptures during those times. What the king got was from a prophet who spoke to him on behalf of the Lord. But again, the Lord can answer things directly or indirectly. Our responsibility is to inquire of Him. And one final example regarding the desire for prophecy. The desire to know just a little bit about the unknown. How comforting it can be. How it may exhort, like with King Hezekiah, to get one's house in order. How it edifies, gives us direction regarding what we should do or should not do. So in Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 14, this after the prophet Jeremiah had been warning about the destruction that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would bring upon Judah, Jerusalem. Now, these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. They were priests. Or question it, yeah, they were priests, but they were prophets who were taken into exile. Yet, this was not coming from those prophets. This was coming from Jeremiah, who was still back in Jerusalem. This was coming from Jeremiah to them, even though there were prophets there. We saw also how, yes, we may have the scriptures, but the Lord may want to speak to us another way. And yes, it will point us back to the scriptures eventually. Continue to verse 2. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother and the court officials, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and the Moriah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. This was a prophecy. It was written down. So the Jeremiah had spoken it or written it down. It was still come from the same source, the Most High God. 
it still had the backing of the Lord. It still had the authority of the Lord. So there are things that we've seen in the scriptures, and there are things the Lord may want to communicate to us outside the scriptures. They'll point to the scriptures and ultimately back to him. Thus is the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. There are times when Paul wrote about being a bond servant of Christ. So even though he was in prison, he said that he was a prisoner of Christ. So even though they had been taken captive by the Babylonians, the Lord said that he sent them. It edifies. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. That's almost like saying get comfortable. But have you ever been in a situation where you thought the Lord was going to do something for you by a certain time and then it didn't happen and the disappointment you felt? But imagine if, if the Lord was just straight with you to let you know it's going to happen but not as soon as you think. It's going to happen but not as soon as you want. For example, there are times when people are going through things and they may look at the scripture and say, well, if I just pray and fast, if I pray like the Ninevites, the Lord have mercy upon me. But it won't happen. And it's not because the Lord doesn't love you. It's not because he's not merciful. But he has things he's using whatsoever to accomplish. And even Jesus speaking about someone to come out by prayer and fasting. You praying and fasting is not going to break it until the appointed time. And you have to know that I don't need to do all these things. For example, yes, I can pray and fast, but pray and fast for a different reason. So that if you do it, you won't be disappointed that you don't get the results that you want and that you do it for something else if you do. Because there are a lot of people that are striving to accomplish things that's not going to get done how or when they want it. And Zechariah 4, 6 comes to mind when the Lord said, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So even this, but in a sense get comfortable so that people aren't trying, like sometimes trying to escape from a situation not going to escape from, because in the captivity is the Lord's will. And a part of this, the children of Israel were being disciplined. So seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile. Because there are times people are fighting, so, oh, the devil did this, the devil did that, when it's actually the hand of the Lord. Where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, for in its welfare, you will have welfare. Hmm. Again, these things are edifying. And even though not very comfortable here, it was also meant to comfort. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. Also with this, having the word of the Lord, because he gave something to you directly, when others come along and try to tell you differently, then you know they're not of the Lord. Now, based on you actually verifying the Lord revealed what's where he did to you, in part based on your relationship with him. It's kind of like Genesis 3. Eve knew not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then the devil came with his voice trying to tell her something different. And what he said was a mixture of truth and lies. But if she, if she had stuck with what the Lord had revealed to her, they would not have gotten into trouble. 
Gamaliel in Acts 5 spoke about not doing things where you end up fighting against God. So all these things are comforting. So if someone comes along and tells you something differently, it is not of the Lord. Because by the way, when you're close to the Lord fulfilling a promise in your life, they're, they're all kind of baits. So I mentioned about the enemy fighting harder towards the end. Him fighting harder may not be more viciously like overt attacks. It could be the seduction becomes greater. Because he's trying to get you to give up. To start looking at something else. And to partake of the fruit the same way he did with Eve. So do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners divine you. And do not listen to the dreams which they dream. You may have heard me say the Lord doesn't give idle warnings. So him warning the people about these things, it meant it was going to happen. The same way in Jeremiah 27, the Lord had the prophet Jeremiah warn the people, do not listen to your prophets who say that the things will be returned soon. In Jeremiah 28, Hananiah came and said the same thing, but the warnings had gone out. Prophecy. Your desire for prophecy, the Lord may tell you something before you even ask him. But he's warning you. That's part of edification. A prophecy may warn you of what the enemy may try. And he may use someone who is not aware of what the enemy is doing. And you can look at Matthew 16 for how the Lord discerned that what Peter was saying. One moment what he said came from a father. Another moment that wasn't the case. Continuing, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. A lot of times when people look at 1 John 4 1 about test the spirits because there are many, because not every spirit is of God, it speaks about the many false prophets who have gone out into the world. A lot of times they make it seem as if every person is a false prophet. But if every person would be a false prophet, the scripture would say, by this point in time, anyone who prophesies is a false prophet. It says, test the spirits. Was well, not every spirit is of God. But something make it seem as if everyone who tries to prophesy or prophesies is automatically false. Or as if false prophets, as if it's something new. There are many false prophets during this time. Jeremiah had visions. Other prophets had visions. The thing that made them a prophet of the Lord or not, in his will or not, or if those dreams, visions, those revelations came from the Lord. So the Lord is warning beforehand. And it's great when you have a word of warning. And especially if someone is coming to you trying to do something and the Lord has already warned you. It is a beautiful thing. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. We also see this in the book of Daniel. Daniel was reading the scriptures. The scriptures which included the writings of Jeremiah. And that's when he saw the thing about 70 years and he made intercession to the Lord because it was time for their release. In Genesis 15, the Lord told Abram that his offspring would be in captivity for 400 years until the iniquity of the Amorites reaches its fullness. So even those things, letting you know how long you're going to be in a bad situation. Because when a person's faith is being tried, one of the things that makes it the trial so hard is not knowing when it's going to end. But at least for them, they knew, build houses. Now when Israelites were walking through the wilderness, they lived in tents because they're going to be moving ever so often. So in this case, build houses, get married, increase, do not decrease. Pray for the place that you are. Because in blessing them, I'm going to bless you. Or blessing it, I'm going to bless you. So they had all these instructions. 
things to comfort them during a time that for the most part was uncomfortable. And the Lord certainly blessed them. Esther became queen. Jeremiah became a governor. Meshach, Shadrach, and, Abed Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were also promoted, etc., etc. So at least let them know it's going to last for 70 years. Again, one of the things when your trial is being or your faith is being put on trial, not knowing how long it's going to last. And if you knew something was going to last for 10 years, it would help with a countdown. But sometimes you're on a cusp of something ending and you don't know. So verse 11 of Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for calamity. And to give you a future and a hope. And by the way, a lot of times people quote Jeremiah 29, 11, But they don't look at the context of it. About these people being in captivity, in exile. And while in such a trying situation, that the Lord is giving them hope. But in a sense, some people, they want the promise without captivity. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And Daniel did these things. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring back, and I'll, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. There's still a place for prophecy, even though we have the scriptures. Prophecy, it edifies, it exhorts, and it comforts. The truth is not always pleasant to hear. Paul wrote, do I offend you because I tell you the truth? So the truth can be offensive, but it is the truth that set us free. So yes, this message. What's my perspective of desiring prophecy, but desiring the Lord even more? Prophecy can help to guide us. It helps us strengthen our faith. So please, do not despise prophecy, but most of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And yes, love your neighbor like you love yourself. God bless you, and Jesus the Christ, whom the spirit of prophecy testifies about, he is Lord.